Hey everyone, welcome to week seven, day four. And uh, by the way, we're painting from life. So remember, this whole week we've been painting from life. And we're painting the uh, materials that we work with. But we're using them as sort of really um, starting points just to talk about color. And Monday we talked about uh, white pigment. Uh, Tuesday, for Spanish Tuesdays, uh, Martes Español, we painted uh, our yellow staple gun uh, and we talked about yellow hues. Yesterday we painted uh, Danny's sketchbook that has a beautiful kind of red-orange uh, page in it with a couple of uh, little color sketches. And today we're going to speak about umbers, earth tones. So let's get to it. Bye. From life. Paint from life. Okay, let's uh, speak a little bit about umbers. And we're going to do that today by painting two of my spatulas that are pretty banged up. They've seen better days. I think if you take care of them, they should, um, <laughs> they should be with you for a few years. But I really, really beat the crap out of them. I honestly have broken many of these. Uh, <laughs> these are my trusted ones for now, but I'm sure that they're going to have seen better days. And the reason I, I chose my spatulas is because I very rarely clean them, wipe them like super, super clean. What I actually do is eventually I take my scraper, uh, the same one I used for my glass palette, and I actually scrape the paint off of them. In all honesty, I don't think they would be really nice tools to put paint with. What they are is they're very irregular in the way they deposit paint. Now, I actually like them for that reason. I don't like to pre-mix my paint, so I very, very rarely, I mean, I've done it on some paintings. I pre-mixed my colors and tubed them, actually, but that's about the only time that I have used my palette knife to, um, to mix my colors. I actually mix with my brush and I feel super, super comfortable with sort of the uh, broken mixes that I have. The mixes of color that have just little insinuations of the colors that are in the mix. I don't really like kind of flat, clean color. I don't really see my, uh, my spatulas, my palette knives as absolutely essential in color mixing. But they do have like a patina in, in the handles that I absolutely love. Because I handle paint so much, my hands get dirty. And because my hands get dirty, it, a ton of paint gets transferred to the uh, palette knife handle. It's very, very nice. In some areas, you can see the actual wood, but in most of the areas, you, you can just see a patina of paint. And I, I really, really like that. So I'm kind of going for that today. The reason I went for my palette knives was that I thought of my umber paint and I said, well, you know, umber is dirt. It's not unlike the earth pigments when I was talking about the yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is an earth pigment that has iron oxide. And the more iron oxide it has, the yellower and then redder it can be. So yellow ochre and red ochre are pretty much the same thing depending on the quantity of iron oxide that they have. With umbers, they do have iron oxide and they can be more towards the sienna side because they are darker in color. And if they have manganese oxide, they actually get darker. I actually like my raw umber to be darker. I don't like that it goes to certain hues. Commercially, you can buy a ton of weird raw umbers and they'll go anywhere from sort of neutral to reddish brown to green, actually. It has, it has a very noticeable uh, uh, green tint to it. I honestly like my raw umber to be the more neutral kind. This is a little frustrating, and it's something we encounter constantly, which is that colors in the perfect world should be just one very specific thing. But the truth is, they are, in many ways, interpretations. So these different companies, these different houses, they interpret the colors in very different ways. And the other thing is, like, sometimes with these umbers, with these earth pigments, some of them are natural pigments and some of them are synthetic oxides. So essentially, they're sort of the same. I, for one, honestly favor the, the more natural pigments. But in truth, if you are not even noticing 
what you're painting with and you're having a blast and you're having a good time and you're making great paintings, then don't worry, don't bother. It doesn't mean that you're missing because you're not using the uh, traditional earth pigment. So no worries about that. Now, the uh, reason I love umber is because I actually see it as a color. And I'll try to explain this a little bit. In the uh, 17th century, Baroque painters, umber was actually used uh, for underpaintings. And it's a beautiful color to use in an underpainting. You can actually thin it down and just draw with it. And, you know, after your underpainting was dry, you could build up your lights from that underpainting. In many paintings, in many Rubens paintings, in many Rembrandt paintings, Velasquez paintings, you can actually spot the underpainting and you can actually see the very thin kind of layer of, of raw umber that's in there. Um, but I actually appreciate the value that it has as um, a pigment that was used in a very specific stage of the making of a painting. But eventually, in the Baroque, they figured out that it was actually a very nice color also. By color, I mean that you don't just impose a use onto a color. And this is super, super, super important thing. Usually, we tend to think of color as in, well, that color is perfect for X, Y, or Z. We do that constantly with, you know, skies. So we're looking for that perfect blue pigment, that really nice blue hue that would be just perfect out of the tube to paint a really nice blue summer sky. Painters do that constantly. They do it with uh, greens also. So they just want to have the perfect green when you're painting pasture, when you're painting a, a grass field in sunlight. And the sad thing about that is we are immediately imposing a use onto a color and we're not seeing any other alternatives for it. I'm not saying that painters just put colors down that they'll use for one thing and one thing only. But if we condition ourselves and we start believing that we bought colors and we put them in our palette because we needed to solve one very specific particular thing, then we're not really using that color. We're just calling upon it because we feel, okay, you are perfect for this. I'm going to use you for this little bit of the painting and then you're gone. And I'm not going to talk to you again. I'm not going to invite you again to my palette. And maybe I will if I do another painting that's kind of similar to this one. And that's kind of what happened with Umber. Umber was actually subjected to these underpaintings and that was it. That was its use. Its use was to be in shadow. It was, it was used to communicate form turning from light to shadow. And it was used to make the shadow mass. But it's very sad because it's a very, very beautiful color. And one aspect of umber that I actually adore is that it's very neutral. It, it's probably one of the most, I mean, if you think of Van Dyke Brown, that could be uh, a little more neutral. But I think raw umber, without being perfectly neutral, it still maintains its earthy tone, but it does kind of feel like a neutral color. Now, and this is super important. Why is it important within my palette? Because whenever I have a particular hue and I want to gray it down, I have two alternatives, and we all do if you think about it. And no, the answer is not just add black and that'll make it grayer. No, that's terrible. If you add ivory black just to make yellow grayer, it's going to turn green. You're not maintaining your yellow hue. You're actually shifting it to the green because you used black to just make it darker. That's why things like, oh yeah, white just makes something lighter and black just makes something darker is such a very simplistic way to understand those colors that it's insanely limiting. But anyways, we have two options when we gray down our pigment. We can actually use complementaries, which will create grays that have a certain hue to them. So if something is way too yellow, if it's too saturated, we can mix a violet and mix it into the yellow and that's going to gray it down. Depending on the quantities that we use, it's always going to be a gray yellow or a gray violet. Now, the cool thing about umber is that we can use it to mix with yellows, reds, blues, and it won't really make them shift. 
So if you really think about it, you can actually add it to, of course, the yellow ochre because that's an earth yellow, that's easy. But you could add it to like lemon yellow in very small quantities and you could still maintain that yellow hue. It's gonna turn a little bit green. I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about that and it does shift a tiny bit. But you could use it with your cad red and it maintains the red. You could use it with alizarin, it maintains that very cool lake red. You could use it with your blue, with your cobalt blue. Uh, you could use it with your ultramarine blue. And it just doesn't shift the color. It just maintains your hue. It makes it grayer, but it won't shift it. That's because it's it's almost like a natural neutral pigment. So whenever we think of, of neutral, we tend to think of just black and white, and we're going to make a perfect gray uh, that is in the midpoint between cool and warm temperatures, and that's our neutral gray. But the truth is there's pigments that can naturally lend themselves to do that job. And I think raw umber is actually a beautiful color to do that. Granted, you have to be very, very careful with which color you buy, because like I said, there's raw umbers that are like green. You know, they really feel green. So we have to be super, super careful. As I said, the coolest thing about this is that we came from Rembrandt and Rubens understanding umber as a pigment that was useful for underpaintings, like these two examples. We then have examples in art history that are quite remarkable, and I'm specifically thinking of a French 19th century painter, uh, Eugène Carrier. He was brilliant. He actually started with uh, Cabanel as his teacher, and he eventually just really, really almost eliminated every single color from his palette. I mean, think about this. He was coming from a pretty neoclassical tradition. If you think about Cabanel was actually Bouguereau's teacher. So this is like the most academic teaching that you can get. And eventually Carrier distilled his palette. He eliminated a ton of hues from his palette he started working with just black umbers and white and using the uh, the ground for his paintings to just add a little bit of warmness. And his paintings are remarkable. I mean, just the choice of saying these colors, they were about to be shunned, if you really think about it. Post-Academy came Impressionism. And with Impressionism came this whole demonizing of all of the earth colors and umbers and blacks because they thought they were dull. They were not interesting. The uh, colors in nature and sunlight were far from those, you know, grays that the old masters uh, uh, used to use. And people just didn't really care about them. They didn't see them as color. So it was amazing that Carrier could actually just explore the possibilities that umber had as color. And when he coupled that with also wanting to emphasize atmosphere, then what he got was just this dark sort of melancholic soup of a painting that is just absolutely brilliant. He He's amazing at, you know, losing edges and finding them again and just grounding form that comes out of perfect, perfect atmosphere. But again, that sense of atmosphere was heightened because he decided to understand umber as color and not just as, you know, what was going to happen a couple of years, you know, after he was working or even while he was working because the beginnings of Impressionism were starting to brew while he was working. Um, again, umbers were going to be thought of as the worst pigments that you could have in your palette. So... That's the reason I, I love my earth tones. I just think traditionally they were seen as limited colors or they were seen as colors that had specific functions at, in moments of a painting, of the execution of a painting. And then suddenly in, in the Baroque, they started exploring those colors and understanding that as colors, they had properties that were absolutely wonderful. And eventually they got you know taken out of almost every single palette and nowadays that we have, you know, we have the opportunity, the chance to objectively look at art history, we can see that color for what it is. And we can actually pair it with 
so many options that we have today and realize that it can be incredibly beneficial for us to have in our palette. I've gone through so many earth pigments. Like I said, I kept my yellow ochre, but I've had raw sienna in my palette, which I I don't really like. I think I don't like the body or the uh, transparency of it. I just think it's a kind of a weak pigment. Um, a lot of people love raw sienna. I particularly don't. I've had gold ochres uh, throughout the years too, but I, I think, well, it's, it's almost the same as my yellow ochre, so I don't really need it. I don't, I don't like my colors to be slightly different. I want my colors to be really different from each other. And if they're just barely different or slightly different, I'm like, okay, I'm just being lazy. If the change is so, so minute, I might as well not put it in my palette. I've had, let's see, Italian brown pinks, uh, which is exactly what it sounds like. I've had transparent red oxides, burnt sienna, uh, burnt umber, and, uh, and raw umber. I used to uh, like burnt umber, but um, it did have a reddish sort of tint that I, I, I didn't really want in my palette. By the way, raw umber, burnt umber, they're the same thing. At a higher temperature, uh, it just gets redder. So if you take raw umber and just heat it up, you'll get burnt umber. So name kind of is self-explanatory. So like I said, it's just about finding the very benign qualities that a pigment can have if we choose not to impose a use onto them. I hope it was cool today. I, I had a blast just painting these two uh, little spatulas, these two little palette knives. It's very romantic to look at your tools and to understand your colors through them. And I hope you guys enjoyed it today. I certainly did. And I'll see you guys tomorrow for our last day uh, in this uh, hue, color, pigment, tool themed week uh, where we'll finally talk about blue, the blues in my palette, which honestly have been only just one blue throughout the years, um, ultramarine blue, but I've recently added cobalt blue, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. So I'll see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.